we're good. We're uh, we're live. Welcome, welcome everybody out there in uh, Cake Land. I'm just kidding. That's how we used to say it when I was growing up. But um, welcome to Land Art and Activism, a um, one-hour talk discussion about uh, how uh, these artists, uh, working contemporary artists, work uh, in collaboration with with land, art, and activism. And so we will want to jump right in. We have four artists, uh, Chip Thomas, Yolanda Hart Stevens, Thomas Marcus Breeze, and Esther Boleyn, each working in kind of a bit of a different uh, media forms, um, backgrounds. Um, so we're going to get started with Chip. And we're going to start off with just them doing their brief introduction on kind of how their art uh, relates to the concepts of land, art, and activism. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. My name is uh, Chip Thomas. I um, normally work up on the Great Navajo Nation in Northern Arizona. Um, and um, in terms of the art I do, I do large portraits of people that I paste along the roadside. But as much as anything, you know, my art is an interaction with the with the land and structures in the land. I try to. Um, find structures as large as possible that interact with the vastness of the landscape um, in Northern Arizona. Um, yeah, so that's a quick overview of what I do. Well, Cliff, how long have you been working on um, in that area? Yeah, I started working on uh, Duneta, the Navajo Nation in 1987. So I've been there for 33 and a half years now, but I started doing my public art practice in 2009. Now yeah. you're listed as an MD, Chip. Um, it's a, that's quite a respectable title. Um, and and you do art. Do you do both, or have you gone on to just uh, to, to the art? No. So my full time day job is, as you said, uh, I work as a family practice physician. And what I like to say in terms of my art practice and my medical practice is when I see patients in the office, I'm attempting to create an environment of wellness within the individual and um, in trying to uh, put up art on the Navajo Nation that reflects the beauty of the people back to the people, the beauty they've shared with me for the past 33 years. I'm attempting to create an environment of wellness in the community. So the two practices are complementary. Right on, right on. Yeah. Well, it looks great. And if people haven't been able to see it yet, we've uh, just about completed the mural. And so if you haven't, please come by and check it out. But we'll move on with uh, Esther Berlin. Now, Esther, uh, her poem is part of the installation. So it's great to have her here. And um, she's a poet. And um, Esther, we want to know how your work relates to the relational uh, relationships in land, art, and activism. Esther Belen, Yanisha, Loga, Danen, Nishlin, Twitter, Chitney, Bushes, Chin, Kidla, Chitney, Dushche, Tad Chitney, Dushanella. Hello, everyone out there listening to our conversation. I have had the great pleasure recently to join collaboratively with um, Dr. Chip Thomas, like was mentioned earlier, on creating um, the, the image with the word, with the text. And I, I think both of those integrate um, uniformly and also they complement complement each other. Um, and I love what Chip mentioned this idea of, of a creating an environment of wellness because I think the his images really add and define and carve out my poetry and I feel like that um, my poetry kind of dig a little deeper into his images as well. And so I really, I, I love that idea of that collaboration. And I love the idea of the active part of it being that, you know, and I, and I said this before in a different talk we had, like, I feel like one of the greatest galleries is driving from like 
um, K Town to Tuba City. I mean, you see the, this art that's alive, that's that's there in the land, and and it really strengthens um, those drives, and and it creates, uh, you know real pockets of um, cultural pride and an appreciation of our landscape, because I think we forget that, um, you know, when we're so busy watching, um, you know, TV or, or social media or the news. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Esther. Um, Thomas? Let's uh, hear from you. Uh, Thomas is a local uh, artist, Autumn, Autumn uh, artist, um, does murals and uh, paints, uh, does a, has a long practice, uh, very involved with the community. And, uh, and he's kind of like, he's our ambassador here from the, the Valley, you know, so we, it's good to have people that are just like local and uh, represent, just about representing and you know the land and and so yeah. how, how does your work yeah thanks marcus and uh thank you uh to chip for <clears throat> recommending me and thank you aaron as well um and hello to everyone that's tuned in my name is breeze uh I, uh my first name is thomas and most people call me breeze like marcus was saying i'm a local phoenix artist i've been painting uh for a number of years close to three decades now in in different forms of public art, not always uh, sanctioned, uh, let's put it that way. Um, and I appreciate the, uh, the, the format that Marcus has created for us with the, uh, the respect and the relationships, reciprocity. Uh, and I forget the fourth one here, but um, so it got me thinking about uh, my, this, this portion here in introducing myself, I, I extend that that sort of theme in the work that I do, it, it's rooted in actual uh, rebellion, becoming, uh, coming from a graffiti background and trans transforming the work into murals later on and becoming uh, a public artist. Um, so the work that I do, it's, it's, it comes from a, a specific area and it's heavily influenced by that, but it's also heavily influenced by my cultures and communities. I myself grew up in the Salt River, Pima Maricopa community. Uh, my father is from Gila River uh, and my mother is uh, Tono Atom from Cells or just outside of Cells. So the, the amount of work that I've created over time uh, is too, many, too much to count, but it definitely has changed with the times as well. And like Marcus mentioned, I also do more than just mural painting. I also uh, do studio work. I'm represented by a gallery out of state. And I also have been working within the Salt River community and other native communities for uh, quite a while, uh, close to a couple decades now, working with young people and working in uh, mural programs and cultural identity and things like that. So um, thank you for having me and, and looking forward to this conversation. I keep muting myself and then I say, hey, I'm talking. Um, that's great. Um, and uh, let's hear from Yolanda. Yolanda, she's a beadwork artist. She works in clay. She's a longtime friend of the Herd Museum. Um, how does your work, Yolanda, how does it, how does it relate uh, to those themes or just to the land or to your culture? Good afternoon. My name is Yolanda Hart Stevens. I'm a uh, Pipash and Kutsan, originally from Fort Yuma, Colorado River. Um, my father is from there. My mother is from here, residing in Gila River, currently out on the West End. So I'm very happy to be invited to um, speak with all of you. Um, and Chip, uh, your work is uh, just beautiful. I went to go visit it last night. Thank you for chatting with me what quickly we did but you know those words are are very um there's just a whole lot there were a lot of things i wanted to um talk about and i was really trying to just you know bring it down to just a few one-liners but it's kind of difficult but you know when we talk about it in terms of land you know i'm i work with clay so i'm working on clay beads i'm here working on them now literally working with the land 
and I'm very happy to meet other uh, clay workers. We share clay or share, you know, information or what have you. And that's how the land gets traded with us. That's what I think of when I'm thinking in terms of land. And then art, you know, uh, again, I go back to the beads. I go back to the acknowledgement of what we see, what we know, what we acknowledge now is commercial um, trade beads. But prior to that, it was clay, shell, stone, bone, wherever you were from the area of this um, um, the country. And so, you know, I, I thought about that. I thought about the land, the, the, the clay, um, actually, like I said, the, the land literally being the art. And so I've been working on beads for quite a number of years. My children um, are there to learn and understand, uh, process the clay, because in every thought, there's a process. In the clay, there's a process. Uh, my granddaughters are in there. They're all participating. They're trying to understand. But, you know, there are just so many things that, that this is related to. So that's the land, the art, and the activism, you know, um, and the respect for it, you know, literally walking on the land. And we, uh, somebody was mentioning earlier about seeing the visual uh, work that Chip has throughout his community and I was thinking you know that's like us we're going along hey there's dirt hey do you think that's any good that's what we're looking for you know uh looking for clay deposits you know sometimes you'll see lines on the road stop you know but it's just dirt but you know what that's what we walk on that's what we have to take care of that's what we create that's how we share that's how we learn this is going to continue on and you know I just all of this coming to mind in terms of um, of land, just land. I could go on, you know, more with that, but the different things, the activism that we were talking about, I have a new installation that I'm trying to um, get accepted with the barbed wire, you know, the protection of the fields, protection of the animals, it's well and good, but it was also in Gila River and uh, outside of Parker and Poston and other communities, there was also um, the uh, Japanese internment camps. So these, uh, barbed wire were used for, you know, segregation. They were used for uh, negative thoughts, you know, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and some of us have carried them all of our life. And to acknowledge that as well, and that being a part of the land. Right on, you. Um, we have a little PowerPoint we'd like to show uh, just to give some con context to the artwork that uh, some of the some of the folks are working on. Yo, of course, has her clay and her beads. Uh, Esther's uh, available with some poetry. I don't know if we have a, it. Here it is. Um, so you guys, uh, Breeze, you want to give a, a bit of a context uh, with some of these and, and their relationship to land, art, and activism? Sure. So uh, this piece is one of my more recent pieces. Uh, I just painted this about a month and a half ago. This is located in South Phoenix off of Central near uh, Broadway. Uh, if anybody is here in Phoenix and you're familiar with the South Side and you know where, uh, just for reference, if you know where Pete's Fish and Chips is on Central Avenue on the South Side, <laughs> it's just one block north of that. Uh, but this piece um, was created with uh, the story of the autumn story of the coyote in mind and how South Mountain got its name in the autumn, uh, the autumn way. Um, and I'll give some more uh, a brief, hopefully brief background uh, about why I chose to paint this story and why I paint murals period within the city. Uh, and this pretty much goes along with, with everything uh, and the reasoning why. So I was approached by One Arizona, which is a 501c3 uh, uh, nonprofit here in the Valley and had asked me to create a mural and they wanted, they had asked me if I could create a piece within tribal lands because they were looking to, to ha see a mural come to life on tribal lands and uh, anybody that is not familiar with this area, the original people of the land are the Akimeratum, uh, as well as the, the Pibosh, 
And uh, the Akhmet Otham and our ancestors, the Huogam, or as most people call the Huogam, um, are the oldest cultures of the valley. And what I had to explain to this particular organization when they asked if I could paint on tribal lands, I said, well, you know, Phoenix is tribal lands as well. And that's what most people don't understand is that before the city was here, this is native, this it was and still is native land. Um, a part of this piece is about not only just the story of the coyote and the jackrabbit and the rattlesnake, which I'll get into as well, but it's, it's more about reclaiming public space and bringing those narratives back into the city where it's often left out. Um, again, you have people that come from all over to uh, the Southwest and they wanna see quote unquote native culture uh, you know, a big reference point is coming to somewhere like the Herd Museum. They want to experience Native culture. Mm. Well, when you come to an institution uh, such as this place, you sort of get this blanket pan-Indigenous view of what Native culture is, and you don't really get to focus. I mean, I guess you could if you really sought it out, but you don't get to really focus on what was here and who is still here, which is our people. And I also do understand that because... Um, I grew up simultaneously within the city and the reservation, that there are people within the reservation boundaries that don't feel comfortable coming into the city. And what I have to explain uh, to myself as well as to try and convince them is that, you know what, it's okay to feel uncomfortable, but also know that every time you are driving around and walking around on asphalt and concrete, you are in the same place your ancestors have been for thousands of years. And with this piece here, I really wanted to bring again those stories back to life and really have that identity of us represented within the city limits because you don't really see us represented. You see every other culture represented, yeah, uh, you but you don't really see the autumn uh, culture represented. So that to me is, is one of the most important parts of this piece is bringing the visuals, bringing the story, but also bringing that identity back and giving empowerment back to the original people of, of the land here. And I also feel the importance of this piece because it's maybe a half a mile from what used to be the river, um, which if anybody knows, you know, that's part of the reason why there are uh, people here and why our tribes did settle here and why culture did thrive here is because of the water and in an, in an environment like in an, well, in this environment, that's the most critical element. So. Reed, you touched on an interesting point. Of course, identity. Land is very much a part of identity. It's grounding us in that identity. But with that identity comes a responsibility. So, uh, Chip, <laughs> let's, you know, can you talk about responsibility and art and how that plays into uh, your work? Yeah, I, can, I certainly can do that, but I just want to ask Breeze if, if he finished his point, because I thought he was about to uh, share something more with us. Sorry, Breeze. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, let's see. The, I'll finish off the, uh, the, the story. I'm trying not to take up too much time, but the story about the, uh, the, um, the mural is, um, uh, so for those that don't know, that do not know, uh, Autumn are very particular about telling their stories in the wintertime and not outside of that time frame. Uh, technically, I, you know, I'm not, it's not quite winter, but it's cold enough. <laughs> so this story is, uh, is about how the, uh, the, the jackrabbit, which you can see on the left, uh, was bitten by the rattlesnake, which you can see coiled up on the right. And once the, rab the jackrabbit died, the people had to decide what to do with the body. So they decided to cremate it. And once they were cremating it uh, and it was on fire, the, the coyote, uh, or ban, had decided that it wanted to try and steal the rabbit. So the ban jumped into the fire and stole the rabbit's heart and ran up the mountain, uh, which, is, uh, which we know is South Mountain. So very fitting to be in South Phoenix here. Um, and as the coyote is running up the mountain, the heart, the heart is dripping grease and drips grease onto the mountain. So it, within the language, it translates to greasy mountain. And you can't quite see it in this photo. Uh, this was a poor attempt at a panoramic uh, uh, photo by myself. Uh, I didn't have a wide angle, but in the very uh, uh, left-hand side, you can kind of see uh, South Mountain there. And I have the, the uh, very iconic uh, light towers that everybody knows now. Uh, anyways, that's just to finish that off real fast, so. 
Thank you. Thank you, please. Thank you, Chip, for recognizing that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Chip, give us a little little background on that I, that concept because you know what he said was it was spot on the the concept of identity. I mean, land and identity. Uh, there's hardly any separation, but you don't just have an identity. Like an identity is something that's in in process. Yeah, let me just get you to on on this image for a second. Um, Go ahead. I had an Go interesting ahead. conversation with uh, Native artist Lakota artist. Uh, Chinupa Hanska Luger a couple of years ago, and he made an interesting point. He was talking about his homeland in South Dakota and um, just, you know, how on this hill, he knows the stories that go with that and he, the stories go back generations and, uh, you know, how he feels very connected to his home because he knows the stories of that land. And in having that conversation with him, it was really the first time I realized that, you know, as a displaced African, um, I don't have a similar connection to the land. But in the land where I've lived for the past 33 years, um, I have heard stories of the land. And one of the stories that I'm telling here, for example, with this particular installation that I call the uh, Green Room, is the Navajo Nation is uh, mineral rich, you know, it's, um, there's coal, oil, uh, natural gas, uranium, and water and, and aquifers. During the night from ni the mid 1940s to 1984, the bulk of our nu nuclear arsenal came from the Four Corners area, mainly on the uh, Navajo Nation. And because the mining laws that the uh, uranium mining companies were using were the mining laws written in the late 1800s for mining precious metals, the, mining, the uranium mining companies weren't responsible for cleaning up their sites once they abandoned, abandoned them in the 1980s when the price of uranium dropped. So consequently, there's over 500 abandoned uranium mine sites on the Navajo Nation that are contaminating the land, which then gets into the groundwater, which then uh, gets into animals and um, ultimately into people. So I am learning stories of the land where I am now and my art is responding um, to these stories that I'm learning. Well, you really touched on something just because, uh, you know, something's there in the ground. It doesn't mean uh, we have to go and get it and we have a responsibility to respect you know, the people around it and the people that live within that area. So it, it does come back to that chip. It does come back to res respecting our responsibility for the land. It's a great piece. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for, thanks for describing that. Yeah. I'm not sure whose piece this is here, um, but no, I wanna- But it doesn't really speak to a, to the conversation we're having, so we can go, I mean, this is, this is related to the coronavirus. This particular piece actually is interesting um, because this is a collaboration that I did with Esther as well. She has a poem that goes with this image, but this image itself actually talks about the Navajo birth cohort study happening up on the Navajo Nation, which again is looking at the effect of uranium and other heavy metals on development of, um, of newborns. And uh, yeah, so it's a uranium-related piece also. But this, this image gives a good idea of how my work plays with the uh, landscape and attempts to retell stories within that landscape. And Esther, as a participant, as a collaborator in this piece, uh, how does that make you feel? And how can you uh, articulate those concepts of, of land, art, and activism with this? Yeah, I think, you know, for these um, sort of huge landscape pieces that Chip does, a lot of the feeling is, is really just, um, it's an immense feeling, right? I think, you know, anyone who's driven through the Navajo Reservation, I mean, the land, is so predominant, it really absorbs you. You know, we're so minute in it. And, and so this really has that um, absorption 
quality to it where you know it has a, a really nice um, local centering point that you know kind of addresses the people who are there that there there is life there i mean i think so many times you you hear from outsiders who are like oh navajo reservation there's nothing there right and and part of it like um breeze was mentioning is that there, there is something there. Like, you know, we just, we need to continue to give, um, give acknowledgement through the art and or presence space for it. And, and I love that because it's almost like, okay, so as we're driving through, we really need to like, just put a bench there and just kind of say, okay, I need to just like sit in this sort of cathedral, right? And, and soak it up. Because, you know, any, any monumental space, especially, you know, our reserva Navajo reservation, which I know best, every time we drive through, there's always a story about the land, right? Whether it's somebody who used to live here, or I picked up a hitchhiker here, or my car broke down here, you know, I mean, there's always these stories um, that kind of come to add texture to and also really anchor anchor us so that's you know it's my privilege to add a little texture add a little more um, complexity and maybe context to that through through the word and 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 that's that's where I I get my main entryway but I think I'm inspired by the image and hopefully someone in turn will be inspired by my words Esther, speaking of which, can we get you to read the poem that accompanies this piece? <laughs> this one, okay. Uh, I gotta find out where it is. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. So on this piece, there's, um, and I'll go at, so the, the first section is on the left side of it, and it's called Enlarge and Expand. This space, make larger this space the space we named empty the space we thought was wasted storehouses seedlings climb over the tantamount peer over the rim dip into the vastness this space expands enlarges today i celebrate nahasan Mother Earth, I sing for her. Every breath in my body sings for her. Tenderly, I posture myself to her access, her rhythm, her pangs, her buried and living utterances. Now all is strangled within my fluid filled lungs, blubbering. Who will be Nahastan's midwife? Who will comfort her while she isolates? Who will gently lift her head out of the clouds of despair? Who will moisten her parched lips with male rain? Who will quench her thirst for balance, harmony, Jean? Who will assuage her labor pains? the tingle and tumble of hero twins, anxious to slay monsters. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Esther, thank you. Very appropriate. Um, Yolanda, you mentioned earlier you had a project going, an installation uh, concept piece with um, barbed wire. Um, that's a familiar sight out here in the West. And we know that, you know, that it has a lot of, people have a lot of viewpoints around it. Can you explain a little bit how, uh, what that is and how that relates to land art and activism? Yes, I just submitted a proposal uh, in the Casablanca area in Gila River uh, for one of the schools that's going up. And that's, um, the whole idea was about the organics, you know, the, the fields and again with, um, the wildlife and uh, animals there. And so, again, I was looking at the barbed wire in terms of protection, in terms of um, 
watching the um, the fields, you know, taking care of it like that and watching the animals and taking care of it like that. But just south of there, you know, right, I-10 right there, you know, past Blanca Turnoff, there was um, an internment, Japanese internment camp there that housed, I want to say 13, 14,000 people um, a number of years back. And, you know, it was, it was here and it, there's still um, remains of it. There's still uh, beautiful things. You can see where the land was, where people were living, the uh, rock gardens, you can see all of that. But also there was a barbed wire there as well. And that was also for the segregation, the barriers, um, you know, and so I started thinking about, again, you know, I didn't know we were gonna do this, but the art and how that is, I mean, you know, sometimes when people talk about art, it has to be pretty, you know, it has to be pigeonholed, it has to be this way in order to be accepted, you know, and, but with the barbed wire, you know, not only here, but like I said, in post and outside of Parker, the same thing. Um, it was used to, to desecrate, basically, emotionally, mentally, the barriers, the segregation. And like I said, it's still there, you know, the thinking, the attitude. And so that barbed wire that's left over, you know, it just went out there recently to take a look at it. I, I feel responsible uh, for no reason, except that's just me, but I feel responsible to go out there and walk out there from time to time, um, just to check it out, just to see how it is, making sure that it's not any more desecrated because when we talk about and that was one of the the terms that you were using you know the land acknowledgement you know we're we're along the river we're river people you know where uh we have the up river the salt river like where breezes you know the hushaloon people they're up that way you know and then us you know people we were people from the west but also in this land maybe it was recent maybe contemporary i don't know what the word is but you know, the Japanese internment camp was held there too. And that had a life of its own, um, good, bad, or indifferent. And when we talk about land acknowledgement, that's something that I feel very strongly about acknowledging. And I talked to my granddaughters and a couple of kids, you know, saying, hey, what do you guys learn in school about the internment camp? What do you know about this or that, you know? And they're kind of like, um, we only know what you tell us. And I'm like, what kind of education is that, you know? But that's just me, you know? And so I kind of, I mean, we're in 2020, you know, kids are teens. There's no real acknowledgement of it, you know? So I've kind of been researching in that sense and trying to do a, a, um, a piece with that. And of course the clay beads, because obviously it's literally the land along with the um, uh, barbed wire and the internment camp and giving acknowledge to the people that were there. Um, and and now, you know, everything that's kind of developed from that gentleman named Lane Nishikawa was very instrumental. I met 20 some years ago in developing, getting that going with the Japanese American Museum in LA. And he's still doing work. Uh, so I like to try to, you know, just kind of keep in touch. And, and even though, you know, we don't come from the same background, that land acknowledgement, you know, we were literally held hostage. We are an internment camp inside of internment camp. And it might not be pretty and people might not want to hear it, but that isn't going to stop me from talking about it. Thanks, Joe. That's a powerful statements um, that need to be heard and represented mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. well, you know, the thing that you touched on there was you know, something that's not being uh, discussed in our relationships and acknowledging how important the land is uh, to our survival, to our being. Um, and so we need to respect that, you know, respect our relations, but respect the land. You know, how important is it for our artwork to um, reveal the land? How important is it for people in urban centers like the, like Phoenix to see the landscape within the art? Well, you know, one of the things I was just talking about, uh, which uh, was kind of funny because um, I, I make hand drills. I use hand drills for shell for different objects, you know, and talk about uh, how uh, 
beads were made, etc. And I was telling the kids, I said, you know what, next time you go see Black and Decker, you better tell them thanks, because it came from hand drills. And it came from things like this. So it's not really art. You know, it's utilitarian. But now they call it art. So now you got to pay for it. You know, I mean, there's a whole different mindset. And even something as simple as um, a cradle board, you know, I have two uh, great granddaughters, all my kids, grandkids are all in cradle boards. And you, you see the hood around it, you know, I said, and I tell my kids that too, you know, look at that, where do you think the roll bar came from, you know, it's a lifesaver, and it was the same thing for the babies. So we talk about art, we talk about, you know, this being nice and whatever, but it was all utilitarian. And those are just two things, you know, off the top of my head, but the hand drill, especially, I said, you, you know, think about um, Black and Decker and those guys that are doing all these power stuff. And there's no acknowledgement to any indigenous people or ideas. There never has been, and they probably never will be. And that's why I keep trying to carry that message so that they have an understanding that things just didn't come out of the air from some, you know, engineer graduate person. They came from people that lived the life that were on the land, that did what they had to in a utilitarian way, even pottery, something as basic as that. Right, yeah, things aren't dropping out of the air. They're growing up from the land. They grow up. So how does, Breeze, how, how does the, the art, what are the lessons that it teaches us about respecting the land? What can uh, art teach us about that? <sighs> If, um, if we aren't respecting the land, then we don't. We cease to have that relationship, period. So then, therefore, we have a complete disconnect. Um, and art imitates life, uh, as we all know, that, that statement. Uh, and being used in the way that Yolanda is describing in a utilitarian way, um, it's important that it's a reflection of our our surroundings, but it's also important that it be used in a way that it's a, a tool and a resource as well. It's not just, art is not just art for art's sake of being pretty. Um, art carries a, a, a messages and, and that identity that we've been talking about. Um, you know, uh, both Yolanda and Esther touched on a couple things. Um, if, uh, Aaron, if you wanna switch, I think you're the one controlling the photos, if you want to switch back to a couple of photos before. Um, yeah, in either one of these. Um, so Yolanda, I, I love the fact that you're using uh, barbed wire, because as you can see, I'm using barbed wire as well uh, in a 2D format. Uh, and I love the duality of Yolanda's pieces and, and concepts that she's doing, uh, both how it represents uh, the uh, uh, different types of containment uh, areas for cattle, et cetera, but also um, reminding people about things that have happened in the past uh, about the Japanese internment camps, which a lot of people, yeah, you, you find out that they don't know that information. Uh, pretty similar to uh, uh, about 15 years ago or so, I did a, uh, I did a project with, uh, or a program with the Scottsdale Center for the Arts, and it was working with middle schools uh, throughout the valley. And I had the ability to write my own program, and I wanted to base I wanted it I wanted it to be based off of the history of the Hulagum and our ancestors and how our people utilized these waterways and canal systems. And I remember teaching those classes to these middle school kids. And then afterwards, the, the teachers and teacher aides themselves, who were also present in the room, came up to me thanking me because they had no idea about the people that existed here before. And I'm thinking to myself, you're an educator and you don't know these things. How is that possible? How is that possible that the, the greater general public doesn't know that? Um, so it was kind of eye-opening at that point, you know, and, and, and Esther said something earlier about the Navajo Nation. When they go out there, people uh, tend to think, oh, wow, there's nothing out there. And then they say the same thing about the desert here in, in the South. Oh, there's nothing out there. And, and, and in some ways, that narrative is true to, to how the city of Phoenix was built. Oh, well, 
those native people that lived here a long time ago and they magically disappeared and they left us this canal system. How about that? Well, that's not true. We never left. We've been here. Uh, but to relate to Yolanda's uh, uh, ideas and concepts about barbed wire, which I really love. So clearly this piece has barbed wire in it. And you know, it, unfortunately, I didn't, you can't see the, the whole image. It's a little bit cropped, but uh, it's the, obviously it's the American flag with a autumn, uh, butterfly basket in the middle, uh, barbed wire, of course, and then a fence with uh, some figures behind it. Now this piece has a lot of different meaning to it and it relates to similar, similarly re relates to uh, the Japanese internment camps, but it's not necessarily about that. So the title of this piece is called History on Repeat. Mm -hmm. And what I had in mind with it was uh, the Japanese internment camps, but also the, the Nazi camps uh, that obviously we all know that story about the Nazi Germany and the Jewish people. Um, but what this reminded me today and what I was thinking about was the kids that you see in cages uh, that are migrant from migrant families coming across the border and that are put in cages. Um, and also the, which I'll, I'll get into with some of these other pieces as we get in a little later into this conversation, the uh, militarization of Dono Atom lands in Southern Arizona, which I also I think a lot of people are not aware that since post 9-11, the amount of, of homeland security down there has increased by, I don't know how many, a thousand percent. But uh, there's a photo somewhere, I think before or after this piece, uh, Aaron, that uh, there. So if you've been to cells recently in the last couple of decades, uh, or down into the Donatum Nation, you might be familiar with these border checkpoints. These are not checkpoints to the international border. These are checkpoints to go in and out of the reservation. There are cameras everywhere. There are border patrol agents. Uh, and this is just the, to get in and out. Once in, uh, be sure that there, there are pl there's plenty of surveillance happening with uh, border patrol agents on the ground, to drones, to Black Hawk helicopters, to you, you name it, it's down there. Um, and that's why, you know, this is related to that piece before history on repeat. You know, what are we doing? This is, this is militarization of, of indigenous people in indigenous land today. We're, we're almost repeating the same things that have happened. And and unfortunately, this relates around the world. Like this is happening, uh, uh, maybe not on the same scale, but uh, shout out to all my my people down south who are down there every day living this, that have to experience this every day, but that are working to the best that are, of their ability and also having relationships outside of this country, namely uh, Palestinian people and their experience that's happening right now. So, um, I'm kind of rambling on now, but I, uh, you can come off at any point, but to, to, to just, again, go back to the pieces that Yolanda was talking about and how it is, was resonating with me right now with these pieces. These are important because they are related to the land and there is a complete disrespect that's been happening. If anybody's been following uh, the situation down at the border for the last year, the dynamiting of sacred sites, the, the, destru the destruction of, of natural landscape down there to build this ridiculous fence that's okay. already falling apart. So, um, you know, these pieces that I've been making also are about revealing that information and, and bringing forth and bringing to light all of that that's happening down there. And I don't have all the answers, but at the very least I can share that information and share those people's stories down there that are living this every single day. Well, Breeze, um, maybe you have an answer. We got a question that came um, from one of our uh, people out there. He said, Breeze, thank you for focusing on systematic problems in our community. How can I connect indigenous, how can I help connect, help connect indigenous history and culture using tech skills? Thank you for recognizing how militarization against indigenous people is a global and local issue. 
So how can I help connect indigenous history and culture using tech skills? Tech skills. So I'm assuming the technology. Uh, yeah. yeah, sure. Media, media and, and using that platform. I think that's the most powerful thing we have, right? I mean, just the way we're uh, interacting right now, the way I think the most or not the most, but a good portion of people that see my work outside of just seeing it in the public and driving around. And a lot of people's work as you see it online and that's just another platform. So I think anybody that is interested in sharing that information, it's it's pretty simple to find. You can Google these stories. They are, there's not a whole lot, but there are, there are uh, outlets that have covered these these stories and, and, and different pieces. I think Vice might have a couple uh, but also even just on social media, if you go to Instagram, and I believe the Instagram is defend, it's the same as what's behind me on the chalkboard or it's similar. I think it's defend Otham Jewett. Mine says protect Otham Jewett, uh, protect the people's land. Um, so that would be one way, uh, just you know, sharing sharing that uh, through, through media, sharing stories in, in that way. So I hope, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, that's a good one. You know, with that technology and with this social media, as we're all here, um, it provides, it's provided a lot more um, situational awareness about these, these topics and these issues in our community. I was talking to Chip the other day and, you know, because he's the MD, I just had to, you know, like talk about our current situation. But how we got here, you know, for Indian communities to uh, be in their place, it has to do with the land. It has to do with the respect for the land because that's what then feeds us, gives us the nutrition. And so how is that, you know, the, the, the work is so important to that, Chip. Uh, you, you made a few comments on that last night, just how your work um, reciprocity, how does there respect? It gives back to that, those concepts and, and understanding of, um, of well environments. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Did I have to admit, Mark, Marcus, that of wealth and well environments or the, you know, as you were discussing with your patients, kind of how that works. Yeah, let me let me share with you a quote that um, really influences and inspires me. It's a quote by Winona LaDuke. Um, and she says, power is not brute force and money. Power is in your spirit. Power is in your soul. It is what your ancestors, your old people gave you. Power is in, is in the earth. It is in your relationship to the earth. Um, and that really says it all. I mean, you know, um, We've talked about the land as being a source of sustenance, um, nutritionally, spiritually, and artistically. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that that really brings it all together. It really does. I mean, the land is reciprocates uh, so much for us. And uh, Esther, how, how can our relationships um, reciprocate? You know, how does art build that reciprocity amongst individuals? Well, you know, Yolanda did a great job of acknowledging the, the practical ways of this idea of reviving and, um, you know, planting seeds in regards to little known, lesser known, or yeah, erased histories right where you know and and i love the usage of the barbed wire because it you know there's so many metaphors that go along with that but it can be like a lasso and i mean honestly i think right now a lot of people need that really um fierce tug to kind of just acknowledge these things, you know, and we've seen that this last summer where we had so many demonstrations, you know, demanding and inquiring and, you know, documenting these histories that have been erased. 
And, and so as stewards of the land, we're also stewards of our talent. You know, we're, we're gifted in so many different ways as humans and, you know, in the art world going along with what Chip said, it, you know, so we have this richness and, and how we use it as in our, in our art is, is really to kind of harness that and, and let people, you know, uncover at sometimes, you know, in, in really uncomfortable ways that there's a, a layered and um, a documented and a vital history that's, that's been kind of paved over. I mean, there's so much asphalt, <laughs> you know, on this land that tries to cover up those, those qualities. And, and I think, you know, I, I love the artists who come in on so many different entry points you know, I think, you know, if I would have had this conversation, you know, 20 years ago, yeah, a lot of my words would have been a lot more jagged, sharp, piercing, you know, but I've had to work not only through that, through educating, but also through the healing portion. So I think the other piece is for tribal people, indigenous people, other disenfranchised groups to really heal you know, where, you know, what um, Chip mentioned earlier, the idea that, um, you know, he's an African man living, he's dispossessed in, in a lot of ways on this continent. And I mean, my heart, you know, when he, he just said that, I mean, I just felt this tug, you know, because that's something I treasure so much that I have access to my own lands you know, and, and I can freely go onto my own land, you know, except recently where we have all these curfews. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, that, that's, that's what our, that's what we provide. That's the kind of momentum and the kind of force that, that we can um, nurture each other with, but also collaboratively. Like I share that energy now with everybody here, right? Even it's through this crazy technology, like your words are really feeding what I needed um, at this moment. And, and I, I really, I, I treasure that. That's beautiful. I've got a question um, from the internet. How large a group of TOs is living on the other side of the border today? And how is that working now? Uh, for those that don't know, the TO is short for the Tono Autumn. The I believe it's less than a couple thousand that are that are Tono Autumns in in Sonora. That it's just south of the international border. Um, so it's 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 a lot lower than than just north of on the north side of the border. However. Um, they have their own set of issues because it, because it is a different country. Once that line, once you cross that line, that that uh, border, it's a whole other world. And for those that are autumn on that side, don't have the privilege of coming north anymore, uh, like they used to. We, we, and for us, for the Tono down there, for the Tono autumn down that way, the border is. It, it, we don't see that border. Traditionally, our lands went all the way down to what would be Hermosillo anyway. Uh, for those that don't know, you know, the, the traditional Autumn lands do stretch as far as what I just said, uh, in Hermosillo all the way to here in the valley. These are traditional Autumn lands, Dona in the south and Akimura in the north. Um, and yeah, our, our relatives down south have, have their own issues and, and, and are in need of, of, of support in many ways as well. And thank you for that question, whoever brought that up. And, 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 and at that point, in this point in time, I'd like to recognize those, you know, if, if anybody's out there watching from that side. Um, yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Well, we're, we're approaching um, our time here, but I want to ask the uh, artist if they have any questions of, of each other and how their work is, uh, you know, how they're working it out in this context of land, art, and activism, if they do. Perhaps not. 
I have a comment. Go, yo. Okay, very quickly. You know, a lot of what um, Breeze was covering as well, you know, I grew up in that mindset of there aren't any borders. You know, that's what the U.S. government told us. That's what we're supposed to believe. Here I am, great grandma, and, you know, they're still telling us that. And so I tell my family the same thing. You know, we get caught up in that. We get caught up in um, how can we heal when we can't acknowledge reality? What is the true reality for ourselves? That's something I think that we need to acknowledge as well. And, you know, everything from land acknowledgement to images, the swastika, that is my family image that we continue to use. I proudly wear it. In 2020, I'm still having to uh, defend it and comment it because of one person that desecrated it again but it, it's the borders and you know the social media is fine and wonderful for those that have it but not everybody has it you know standing rock where was all that information nothing there I had an opportunity to spend a little time there so social media is well and good but it's very limited and again the segregation the barbed wires got that tied up as well you know and i want to heal i want to heal i want my kids to understand i want my community you know, and, and even in that, you know, sometimes we say, oh, I live in this district. district. No, we go all the way down to, you know, Baja, California, Northern Arizona, Nevada, you know, uh, Arizona all over, you know, so there, there isn't any. Let's not do that to ourselves. And if you're, you know, really influenced and told that when you're young, you're going to grow up and think that. And you never know that you're going to be able to have to heal from that. And that's kind of what I'm speaking to today. That's why I wanted to be here. Even this institution that we're sitting at, you know, is on, on, on our land, even though that we're here. Yes, it is. You mentioned something really interesting. I think it's some that um, perhaps uh, the image, you know, barbed wire on our brains. It's like, it's, it's, it's not allowing thoughts to come in and it's, you know, not allowing us to share uh, freely as well. So, we have barbed wire around our heads. There's a thought that just the image when you said that was quite beautiful. Um, well, I really appreciate everybody uh, participating. If uh, any further questions, comments, um, I had a good time and, and uh, great perspectives on the art, land, and activism. So thank you very much. Thank you for the effort. Yeah, thank you for having me, and thank you, Yolanda, Esther, and Chip. Um, yeah, I feel like we could have done easily another hour, uh, as these things feel like they fly by. Um, I'll, I'll I'll leave with I'll leave us with one one comment as well. Um, uh, discussing these 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 borders and these these issues. I mean, there's a whole lot to cover, and that could be a completely separate uh, conversation, but. I think one of the most important things that I try to keep in mind to myself and that I try to share with others, uh, especially other uh, autumn or uh, other artists that are from my communities is that going back to what I was talking about earlier, are people coming into the city and not feeling welcome or not feeling like it's quite home? Um, I think a big part of that is, is breaking down those, those, bo those borders and the barriers up here first. Uh, breaking that down and and cutting the wire so to speak and reclaiming it in your mind and in your heart and in your spirit and knowing that you are home regardless and that all of this is temporary and just keep pushing forward those are great words marcus yeah i wonder if i can um, impose on esther once more to share with the signing of lament which is the collaboration that I, we just installed here on the herd I think of a beautiful uh, parting words. Okay. Very fitting. Very fitting. So I will end with the sonnet of lament. And this is um, a poem that is um, part of the piece that Chip installed here at the herd just yesterday and finished up today. Esther, let me just say that two people came up to me and asked me if this poem is about war. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about what it's about? Yeah. Um, so 
in in a sense i mean you know in a sense yes right i think a lot of tribes you know i hear this more from some of the northern tribes who always you know remind us that um we never ceased war <laughs> with the u.s government you know we're we're still there's still unfinished business and and those negotiations are still ongoing and and a lot of those are happening in federal courts, state courts, all the way down. So that is true. And I think this idea of the lament, right, is the grief because we do have, and, and this is speaking more to the psychological wound, right, the spiritual wound that we inherit through intergenerational trauma that we're unaware of, you know, that we wear like a cloak that we have no idea that's what we're carrying, right? And and so it, it really is that idea to now have that um, awareness that this, it, the effect on, on the person and the land, how we see our land, you know, so for I, I'd say, you know, for as many people that get strength from the land, there are as many people who um, are unable to connect, right? And and so it's really that reconnection, not the severing, you know, because I think we've, we've already experienced that in so many different levels. I mean, people were talking about the Herd Museum here, and one of the things that they're known for you know, Phoenix area, we're on what Indian School Road is so uh, present here, the Indian boarding school. And the Heard Museum has a has a pretty decent Indian boarding school um, exhibit. And, and so those kind of things, you know, really um, saying, yeah, it, I might have not been a student there, but that affect those, you know, um, spiritual wounds that my ancestors had, I have them. And I don't even know how that happened, right? You're carrying this. And, and so that that all goes into there. So it is, it is a war. We are, um, you know, prisoners of war in a sense. And, and, we're, and, and then all of us here now, we're ready to um, deconstruct part of that and, and rearmor ourselves with the art, because I think that's a very uh, powerful weapon that creates a common ground. Thank you. So, sonnet of Lament. The globe inside my head remains diseased. Thoughts cease. No reason fashions in my mind. The yard birds peck the dead, the helpless blind, the corporately cut lines of amputees lie near yesterday's expunged honorees. My grasp of old taints new harvest is brine. Bitter waters appease those left behind. Nightly groanings quench the soul, the strip tease twirl on the land of those dim, pale, and poor. Nourish the frontline soldiers, cradle those health workers, meat packers, teachers, the store clerks, mothers of the unborn, all that grows. Sweet water calls and cannot be implored. Drink of new life, only creator knows. I can't. That was intense and, and great way of following up with this. It's here at the Herd Museum, folks. If you haven't come out and seen it, it's here. Please keep respecting responsible relationships reciprocity, please, and we move forward. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. That's all we have. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And